What is the real reason that the Artemis One space launch system didn't launch today? I bet you don't quite have it because a lot of the articles have made a lot of mistakes and I'm here to clear the record to explain to you why it didn't launch and a subsequent thing or two that came up and that really drove this this morning. Hi, I'm Greg Allison from Galactic Gregs. I was on console last night and part of the thing up all night and I actually uh, ran a video too. You can watch that video and get most of the details out of that video, but here I am to give you the skinny, the rest of the story and a, a skinny short video. Now, hang on, here it is. First off, you gotta understand that a rocket is uh, like a long chain. It has many, 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 many parts and components and they have to work. And in fact, everything that has to work on a rocket is called a crit one system. And if it fails, you fail. The rocket does not achieve mission success and is likely to go boom. All right, well, guess what? There's not many systems on a rocket that aren't crit one. There are a few, but 95% of what you find on a rocket is a crit one system. <laughs> so um, in the future, talk about what you do to make sure a rocket don't go boom. But uh, to, to get all these videos, subscribe, bang that notification bell, and click all on my channel. Now, here we are. Let's get into it. Uh, this morning, we were all poised to launch the Space Launch System's Artemis One rocket, NASA's Artemis One rocket. And we, uh, we were uh, totally fueled, almost totally. Everything was fueled up, ready to go. And we went into an engine chill down procedure. And what they do is they bleed uh, fuel and oxidizer through the engine uh, valves at a low enough bleed rate that you're not just hitting them all at once like you would when you're firing an engine with that cold cryogenic fuel because that produces a lot of stress in your systems. You got to condition them. In effect, the process is called condition. You have to condition these engines to get them ready before you fire them. You have to condition the feed lines, everything, get them down to temperature. If you don't, you're going to be uh, causing a lot of stress on the metals because metals contract when they get cold and you, you've got to be prepared for that. Now, uh, and that's a huge thermal stress going from uh, room temperature to those cryogenic temperatures of minus 230 something, minus 400 something degrees. Okay, now that said, engines uh, one, two, and four did just fine, but engine number three seemed to have a real problem. Engine number three just didn't seem to be chilling down according to the sensors. Aha. I don't mean sensors like that take out what you say. I mean the sensors that feel things, detect things, <laughs> not feel. In, in, in the world of hardware. That's what people do, right? <laughs> That's empathic. All right, no fun. So uh, <laughs> the uh, sensors have to detect all these things. We have the rocket loaded with sensors and some of these sensors are crit one systems. Now we try to build redundancy into them, but usually. Okay, what happened here is all the other engines, except engine number three, were showing that they were properly preconditioned. But engine three was reading 90 degrees room temperature or their Florida morning temperature. And that was not acceptable. And, and so the engineers tried several different ways to, uh, to get that uh, fuel flowing into that engine and they kept getting the same results. And in fact, uh, one of them made a comment that, wow, this is the final laws of physics because this thing ought to be flowing and chilled down. And in fact, temperature me me measurement on the ground actually indicated the ground was at 30 degrees which uh, to a lot of engineers suggest, oh, this thing actually did cool down. In fact, a, a good number of us believed that this thing operated correctly and that the sensor was bad. You don't hear that on any of the other channels, right? But, you know, this is just some of the things that happen. You get uh, false positives. False, we've had sensor problems from the get-go. You always will. It's just part of the nature of it. But anyway, so uh, a lot of us think we had a sensor problem. The problem is we couldn't validate it. We couldn't assure absolutely that's what was going on. We had to make sure we knew what was going. We did not want to take a chance or a risk at blowing up a, a $2 billion rocket on the stand uh, on its maiden voyage. So uh, to err on caution, NASA decided they didn't have time to complete all the checkouts before the launch window was going to end. So they decided to scrub the mission. Now, you may have heard it. There was a fuel leak, too, and the fuel leak was one of the reasons. Actually, the fuel leak is what kept them from doing subsequent testing to, to see and, and learn all the data they could about what was going on with this fuel rocket. That and the fact that fuel had been in the tanks for a while and was getting a little warmer than what they would like. And suddenly there was a lightning warning, phase two warning, which says that there was a probability uh, greater than 20% of lightning within like 20, uh, five miles of the center. So uh, they they had to scrub for that reason. You don't want a, a rocket full of loaded with fuel 
uh, where you got something venting and leaking and you got lightning in there. No, 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 no. So they decided to do uh, the air on caution and get that thing uh, detanked and, and, uh, and take care of business. So they made the proper decisions. No doubt about that. I have no qualm with that. But uh, the fuel leak was not the immediate cause. That was something discovered when they were trying to look at doing some uh, data analysis, just to more better characterize what we had on the pad, what was going on. And that's a learning exercise. And anytime engineers can study something like that, they like to do that if they can do it without risk. Now, they were actually doing risk analysis to see if that was a safe thing to do. I and mean, there's some other problems with, with this whole thing I'll go into. Now, when you start worrying about a fuel leak, here's what you worry about. You got to worry about uh, where's it coming from? There was some thought at one point that maybe there was a crack, some fuel earlier on leaking through a, a crack in uh, one of the flanges, uh, like frangible uh, uh, interface flanges coming through somewhere where that's, they shouldn't have fuel in that anyway. So that didn't make sense when I heard that. But the thing is that, you know, sometimes you just get vapors floating around and, and the, apparently they looked at was the problem. But this other problem, apparently later from what I've read, happened to have been a, uh, a, just a hydrogen vent valve that was stuck. And then, you know, that's typical. You get a, a bad valve or maybe a quick disconnect messing up, something like that. And that's fortunate because here's what you got to know. When you fill these rockets up, even the tanks, they undergo tremendous stress. It's not just the weight and pressure of the fuel, it's the temperature, the temperature differentials. When you tank and detank over and over again, the more you do that, it puts a fatigue loading on the system. And a system can only withstand so much fatigue loading. And to give you an idea of what it's like, take a paper clip, metal. Now, you can bend it, and it'll bend okay. And you can bend it again, and it'll bend okay. And you can bend it again, and it'll bend okay. But if you just keep bending, it's going to break. And that's what happens. So you start forming cracks in there. And like our skin, that we can cut it, it grows back. Metal don't grow back. At least not any metal we have this of yet. <laughs> Maybe nanotechnology will produce self-healing skins and structures one day in the future if it don't turn us into gray goo first. <laughs> but in any event, so that's the state of the art. We had this, though, no, some people talk about smart skin technology. We were looking at that when I was working for the missile defense stuff back in the late 80s, smart skin technology. I don't know what I can say about that. <laughs> for some reason, we still don't have it out in the field. But anyway, uh, there are, uh, this is an issue that we have to look at. How many times can we load this rocket and, and unload it? You gotta remember, this rocket was loaded twice uh, for the green run. We had a short green run test and we had a full duration green run test with this stage, this very stage. And then we uh, have taken it down there and loaded it this morning and uh, attempted a launch. So the next time is going to be the fourth loading on this system. How many times do you want to keep doing that? It's a good question. Every time you do it, it goes through more stress. Uh, Elon Musk, you know, looking at doing a whole lot of loading with his systems in the future. I don't think maybe his methane don't have to be as cold, but uh, as a liquid hydrogen, he is going to have locks in the system. So, uh, but locks tanks are typically smaller and built a little different. So, these are things to take into account. These are all things that drive a rocket design. And you have to, the rockets, you know, uh, have to be as lightweight as possible because the more weight you put on, the more fuel it takes. And you have to have fuel to lift fuel to lift fuel. And so that's why you get such big fuel tanks. So, you got to get the weight down as much as possible. That means you make things as skinny and as lightweight and as little design margins as possible. You still need a positive margin of safety in the, the design of structures so that they can withstand uh, loading, that they can withstand uh, things like it before they yield, before they break. Uh, so these are failure modes that you have to look at. But so we got to pay attention to this the next time out. And so we're actually looking at having uh, the, the next launch date is the 2nd of September. And then uh, that's this Friday. And then the next launch uh, uh, window we have is Monday, the, you know, and uh, Labor Day. So it'll be Monday morning. It'll be about the same time as what we went through this time. So I'll be up overnight again. <laughs> Get up real early for the launch on uh, Wednesday and set up all night again uh, another Sunday night if we don't manage to get off the ground uh, Wednesday. We hope we get off the ground sooner. The sooner the better because, uh, again, we don't want to fatigue load these systems any more than we have to. So hopefully everything is good. It seems to be. Uh, the spirits seem to be high for getting another uh, uh, flight opportunity on Wednesday, and maybe that'll be the charm. Because, quite frankly, at the great, uh, last uh, uh, wet dress rehearsal, we didn't quite get it to the point that's at this time. So there was a few new lessons learned. We had almost there, so they thought they had it characterized, but they didn't get to the point where they were actually 
vehicle and the engines <laughs> where they actually had to go through this uh, engine condition and exercise. That's really what it is, it's, it's conditioning the engines. And that's a critical thing. And in all probability, all four engines were actually conditioned. We just couldn't verify. And verification is a key before you like to match, like the candle, as uh, Alan Shepard called it, <laughs> on these rockets. You've got to make sure that you know what you got and, and it's characterized and validated. Once you really know you got everything 100%, then you go. If you don't know, then you blow. <laughs> you don't want to blow. So uh, there's Allison's rules of rockets that I came up with back when I was developing rockets in the nineties. And uh, I figured it was like this rockets go boom. That's law one law two rockets ha have always gone boom and ro law three rockets always will go boom. But our job is to make them go boom a whole lot less often. <laughs> so there you go, my friends. Uh, so we'll be at this again, but uh, really the root cause was, well, absolutely. I can say the root cause, was that we could not validate a uh, condition, properly conditioned engine number three. These are the RS-25s. They are actually space shuttle main engines, SSMEs. They were taken off the space shuttle and put on SLS. So we're going to go through a number of those. And then we have a program to build some uh, cheaper versions of the RS-25s that aren't as uh, uh, high Q as the uh, Ferrari type uh, engines that we have on the space flight system today the old shuttle engines, which were built for many, 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 many reuses. Once you don't have to reuse them so many times, you can you don't have to build them up the same way. They, these are some of the most efficient, they're almost at the theoretical efficiency for a liquid engine. 425 seconds vacuum specific impulse, which is pound thrust per pound fuel consumed, which in rocket parlance is like miles per gallon, <laughs> for those of you that don't know. So I try to bring, bring this down to language that everybody understands. And if I'm didn't explain something well enough, come me some in the comments below. And uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind next time I talk about this stuff. So that's said, uh, said enough. We know now that we had a, a failure to validate the, the condition of an engine. Many of us suspect it was due to uh, the sensor. We'll know more soon. I said many of us suspect. I'm not saying that's a given, but many of us suspect that. Uh, so that's that's an interesting little tidbit there. And if it's just a sensor, that actually makes it better because it means we don't have to replace this rocket engine. Hopefully that's a, something to be repaired and replaced fast or fixed without a major rework because we had to really take an engine out. It's back to the VAB. And it means we won't be able to do anything this coming Wednesday. And it may put a lot of pressure even on uh, next Sunday morning or you know, Sunday night, Saturday, Monday morning. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, let's hope uh, we get this thing off on the second try. That's all I got to say. That the, the sooner the better. Let's go to the moon soon. With that, I'm going to say thank you for watching and Greg out.